Hello and welcome. My name is Manuel Quintana with Pragmatic Works. And in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the Custo Query Language, or KQL. If you've been following kind of my recent series, just kind of introducing you to the kind of various topics of real-time intelligence within Microsoft Fabric, this is kind of focused around that series. So make sure to check that out if you haven't already. We, of course, have the intro to RTI. We have the intro to the event house. We have intro to event streams. Now we have intro to KQL. So you're going to hear the, either hear me say the Custo query language or KQL, but both are synonymous. At the end of the day, right, we're talking about a query language. We're talking about a way to basically retrieve data from some sort of source. And that's the key piece here, right? For those coming from, let's say, a T-SQL background, if you're using you know, Microsoft SQL databases, this is the language we're going to be using when querying data from our streaming data sources. So this is the language we use primarily in real-time intelligence to query the tables in our KQL databases. But it should be noted, of course, that KQL, it didn't like come about with the introduction of Fabric RTI, real-time intelligence. This is something that we can see in things like Azure Data Explorer, Azure Monitor, so Log Analytics, Microsoft Sentinel, and other services. So this language has been around for a bit, but unless you're on that side of kind of Azure, you may not have been introduced to this. But if you're diving in and you've been using Power BI and your company's interested in Fabric, and you are working with streaming data or data in motion, then KQL is something you're going to want to get interested in and hopefully excited about. And in this session, we're just going to talk about then hopefully kind of fan the flames of that excitement because I am really starting to enjoy and love this KQL language. So within the scope and lens of this presentation, how we're going to go through it. I am going to kind of focus on real-time intelligence within Fabric. But of course, once again, if you learn KQL, there's other areas where KQL could come into place, uh, into play, pardon me. So let's talk a little bit more. We know where it's used, but what exactly is the Custo query language here? Once again, it is a query, right? It's a, a request for us to be able to process data and then return results, just like you would with T-SQL on a SQL database, right? And when we further get into this, of course, not only are we talking about kind of reading data, but you can add things like calculated columns, you can join tables together, you can do a ton of different things as you would expect from other traditional query languages here. A lot of times what I'm going to be doing, because it's the most common, is correlating what we're doing in KQL to what we'd be doing inside of, let's say, T-SQL. So when we go to reference a table in SQL, we talk about our from clause. Well, in KQL, there really isn't like a from clause. You literally just write the name of the table. That's it. We're going to see that. It's very simple, very easy. But there are things that are shared, things like where clauses. Select statement, not really a select. It's called a project statement, right? So just different kind of terminology here. But I think by using SQL to kind of relate it, uh, it'll make it easier to understand. But as with any query language, it really just takes, you know, practice and using the actual language itself to really start feeling comfortable and good around it. But there is a lot when it comes to KQL. In my personal opinion, when I started working in this, it feels like this amazing combination of like SQL mixed in with Power Query because because of some of the powerful transformational capabilities there. Also bringing into the mix something like Python even because there's just a lot of built-in functions that you can leverage which do very, very powerful things. Of course, this is an introductory video, so we won't probably go to that full length. But as you explore, as you go in more and more and deeper and deeper into this, I think you'll be just as excited as I am. Continue on, you can see there's some basics in here. You can see some of the syntax as we put different, basically commands, if you will, or clauses in here, if you want to call it that. Um, there's going to be a, using the pipe symbol. That's going to be our separator. You can see that information. And it just it's very readable. The way you move through this statement still feels just so logical, which is, which is awesome. In here, you can see just some where clauses in there coming into play. You can see account statement in there. But realistically, and there's a small breakdown here of some very basic operations. Literally, this is what you write. So you'd put the name of the table at the very top, and then the next would be the next line with a pipe. And then what do you want to do? I want to do a count. I want to do a take, which would be like a top, right? Take is just literally get the number of, get this many records from my data set. There's no real sorting in play there. Where clause, pretty simple. Project would equate to your select statement. Extend is like a calculated column. Sort is, of course, going to be like sort or order by, which you can use order by actually here. And then there's a cool little feature, which you won't go too far into, but you have a render capability. But we're going to focus actually in another video around how you can create real-time dashboards. But the great part is you can either use KQL or there's an option to visualize your data, like write what you're looking at. So it's really cool when you're letting, now this is where we get into real-time intelligence specific. When we run a query, a KQL statement inside of our real-time intelligence 
event house, you're of course default is going to return in some sort of result grid, very tabular rows and columns, as you would expect. But we have a great little option to just visualize the data right there in the KQL query set, which as we'll see in a future video, you can then just kind of say, hey, I want to take this KQL statement and I want to use it to create a tile in a real time dashboard. But that's a different video. Make sure you keep your eye out for that. It's going to be kind of like the last video that wraps up this real-time intelligence series. So now that we have just this kind of basic understanding of the Custo query language of KQL, once again, we're going to look at it through the scope of Fabric and using it inside of an event house and a KQL query set. So in order to do this, we're going to need some data. So let's sneak away from the PowerPoint itself. You can see I'm in a Fabric enabled workspace. Remember, if you haven't, if this is like the first video you're seeing around Fabric in general, I highly recommend maybe checking out some of the other videos, like the intro to RTI might be a good start. But also there's just a video around introduction to Fabric so you can understand licensing and how to get what's called a Fabric enabled workspace so you can actually use Fabric workloads. So in our case, fabric enabled workload uh, or workspace, you can see I'm using the trial itself. We're going to lean into one of the many sample data sets, which is a really cool, really great way to learn many of these workloads, not just RTI, but that's what we're going to leverage here. So if I go over into the workload section, you can see it loads all this up. All of your workloads are here. And we're talking about, in this case, real-time intelligence. And you can see that you can say, I want to look at real-time intelligence samples. Now this is an end-to-end -end example, right? If you get this, you're going to get, I mean, the works. You're going to get an event house. You're going to get event streams. You're going to get a data activator. You're going to get a KQL query set. You're going to have a real-time dashboard, all of it in one go. If you want to check it out, absolutely check that out. This also here, if you go to the real-time intelligence sample, this also, you can see when I open up, you have choices on what you can go into, but this is going to be pretty all-encompassing as well. Once again, event house, event streams, the whole nine yards. So rather than doing this, so like I said, and we'll just forget about this one item that I've created. You can see it's showing me now all the stuff. And this is a cool one. We showed this off in the, we used a similar source in the event stream YouTube. This is taking that same one, loading it into a table. There's actually an event stream and all this good stuff. But we don't want all of that now. Our focus in this session, of course, is to dive into and look at specifically just using KQL. So you can see by clicking on that, I created all of this as part of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up. We don't need this. So if you wanna use this as a sample, actually go right ahead. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clean this out because we're just gonna do, the, there's a simple event house option, which is what we're going to be doing. And it's gonna be around weather related data. So once I got this all cleaned up, I'm gonna go right back to that same location where we go to workloads. I'm gonna go here to my real-time intelligence and I'm gonna go into the explore event house samples just to keep it nice and controlled. And once again, I'm gonna go with this weather analytics. There's other choices in here. If you wanna do something else, feel free. Cause as you're gonna see, it's gonna create my event house. Now there is no event stream in here. So technically this is just kind of static data that's sitting in here, right? It, it does have a KQL query set, right? We can see that it's loading this in here and it's opened that KQL query set up, but that's about it, right? If you wanna check out the welcome screen and all this stuff, they have some quick links to helpful information. You can do learn more. It talks to you about co-pilot stuff. But if I look at my workspace, once again, an event house, the database, which has the table in it, and then a query set, which both of these have already been opened up. So we're going to take advantage of what we have right here, right? Let me get out of the screen again. You can see if you're looking for another overview, nice quick link right here at the top, a quick reference guide. Microsoft has provided this here but then we can actually see this, right? And if you want to kind of try this out, you can see right away, it starts with just the weather and take 10. That is the name of our table right here. But if you wanted to, like even before any of this, right? I can go right in here in this line. If I just want to look at the table, I just put in the table name. I don't even have to have an additional pipe, just that's it. This would be, it's funny, like when we think about T-SQL, right? You have the second command you write, the second item you have to select, and then you have the from. But as we know, if you get into T-SQL, that's actually, even though it's the second thing that you kind of write out, the from statement, uh, it's actually the first thing that gets processed. So I always felt that's kind of weird that you don't write SQL in the order that it's actually executed. That's actually processed by the query engine. Here, it just feels so much more organic, right? You just start with the table you're interested in. That's it. So you can see, I just put the name of the table and I can see all of my columns, all of my rows is, is just basically equivalent to a select star from weather, if you wanted to. Speaking of which, select star from weather, SQL, right? We're gonna see it's right in the results, the same exact results come back here. So you can actually write 
some SQL. You can't do everything because naturally there are some functions and some, some things that are specific to the Kusto query language. But if you don't feel too comfortable with KQL and you're kind of starting with, you know, if you know SQL and you're just starting with KQL, just know that there are some things you can do with T-SQL. And to go even further, right, you can actually use this as well. If I wanted to go, actually, you know, we'll do it with the next example. You can see down below that it's provided us with weather, but a take 10. As we talked about, this will be equivalent to the top in this. And it reminds you, take operator return specific number of rows. There's no sorting or ordering that could be added later. But as you can see, 10 rows and that's it. SQL, we're talking about top. But check this out. Maybe I didn't know how to do this. You can write explain, right? Sometimes I'll separate this as well, just so I can have this. So we can have some identifier, explain, and then we're going to write SQL. Select top 10 from weather. And what you're going to see here is, got to watch out for case sensitivity. Look what it has here, right? It's showing me, now in this case, notice that it actually created the entire, but this is KQL. It's saying, oh, you wrote this in SQL. Let me show you how you could write it inside of actual KQL. So we'll see that it's using the first object and you can just copy this, right? We can literally just go here and copy this. Now, granted, it's a little more built out than it's necessary because it's actually going into, it's funny, it kind of converted the 10 and made sure it's an int, but you can see this is going to return the top 10 rows, but the select star has explicitly done the project statement. So in this case, select star, of course, translated. But if I had specified my select, it's cool. This would actually tell you how do you write that KQL equivalent. So explain really cool things that you can dive into. Once again, if you know the SQL, throw that little dash dash explain in there and it'll actually show you how you could write this with KQL. So pretty cool, pretty powerful in that kind of migration into learning Kusto. But then we continue, right? We know we label our table. In this case, we're specifying we only want five rows. And then we're saying, you know what? I have a end time and I have a start time because we're monitoring storms. I just want to know how long the storm lasted, right? And we know it's a very simple means of subtracting one column from another. And we're doing that. We're calling and we're creating a new column here. Extend is going to be that calculated column. We're calling it duration. What is that column equal? We're kind of defining it. And it's just take end time, which is a valid column, subtract start time. And notice in the order of operations that we're writing this, now the option of duration shows up within the IntelliSense as something to choose in my select statement. Remember, that's the project. So here we're gonna see, we're gonna return these five columns, just top five rows of this, and we're getting this new value of duration, right? So in our case, that first item, we don't really have any time associated with it. So it's coming back as zero, but the rest we can see, hey, this lasted five hours, this lasted six hours, so on and so forth, right? A very cool, exciting language. And of course, aggregations on the table. We can use summarize here. How do we want to do this, right? So we create basically as you would. If you're aggregating, if you put sum of sales amount, you would then alias that column or else it's going to come back blank. Well, here is the name of the column, storm count. What is the aggregation? And here, we're simply counting the rows in the table. Type of storms, that's going to be, I want to do a distinct count of our event type, right? And all this will be grouped by state. You can see that's what we have here. So in this case, we're just grabbing the top five, right, by storm count. So the top five states that have the most amounts of actual storms. So you can see that is going to be Texas, Kansas, Iowa, and Illinois. Those are our top five states by the actual aggregation that we did. And we can see within the 4,701 events, storms that occurred in Texas, there was a variety of 27 different storm types, right? And you can dive in if you kind of look at the event types, you, can, you know, hail, storms, snow, storms, all these different things. There's, I think there's 46 in this data set. And you can always see, explore that, right? You can go in and just get a distinct of the actual list of event types. But as you can see, it continues in here, right? This goes into, and notice every single visual. If you wanted to, with this query, I could go hit add visual. I can go in here and say, you know what? I want to view this as a column chart. And here it is. We have Texas. We have, uh, you know, it's, there's a bit of a skew here in that we have, maybe it might be better. If you can see the values of our storm count, obviously is skewing the data of our type of storms. So maybe we could do something that has like a line and a area chart. Let's see here. So we have there column potentially, right? This is something that I might consider using a different visualization. Or of course, we can just exclude the actual option here for the, what was that? The type of storms. We could of course eliminate that because it might be just a bit of an outlier in that regard so that it just doesn't skew that information here. So that's something that I might consider 
in this case, right? That's something to look at. We could make that manipulation. I would just go here with probably just storm count if we want to compare it. You can see it does let me pick both if I wanted to, but in this case, I think there's just an issue there when it comes to the actual disparity in the values. But the cool part is all of this is at your disposal, right? You can query and you can add visuals right here into the mix, which is really cool. And also you can actually do this just by writing out the KQL. You can see I can run this other statement and it's we're saying render it as a pie chart. So this would be the equivalent of me going into the visual, choosing the pie chart and the dropdown, basically mapping everything where it needs to be. But when you just write render, it basically does that work for you. So you can take advantage of these visuals. And you can see, obviously, this is me in a KQL query set. This, of course, the KQL query set lives as an object inside of the workspace, which can be shared with others so they could see this too, right? This is update. You can see I can save this. So if I have it in the workspace and I invite someone to see it, they would see this also. But I wouldn't describe this as the predominant way that we should share these insights with our organization. That would actually be more with like a dashboard, which you'll notice right here. I have this query highlighted. I've executed it. If I wanted to, I could pin this query, the one that is currently highlighted that I've executed, I could pin that query to a dashboard in which I can leverage that pie chart, bar chart, line chart, you name it, right? We could go in and create a dashboard that way. And that's probably going to be the best route. For me though, for if you're just hitting here, trying to do some ad hoc analysis, query the data, look at stuff, and you'd like it to be visualized, it's amazing that we have this feature and capability built right into this tool. There's a lot of options in here, guys. There's way more sample just for this one data set you can explore. Uh, you know, I recommend check it out. Just look at how much more you can explore when it comes to this. And that being said, right, I would say from the introductory perspective, you know, querying the data, returning results fall under that range. But KQL within the concept of real-time intelligence is going to be used for other things too, such as policies. And this is where you get into the kind of transformative capabilities of KQL, which is a little bit more advanced, but it, you're going to continue as you kind of increase your skill set. And we'll probably do a more advanced KQL class later, talking about like mirror policies, update policies. This really gets into a deeper conversation around things like medallion architecture. But at the end of the day, all of that would be done with KQL. If you're even thinking about RTI, real-time intelligence, KQL is going to be on the menu. So really start looking into it. You know, you should be pretty excited. I think it has a low barrier of entry but it has a high ceiling for capability and functionality. I hope you enjoyed and definitely check out some of the previous videos for real-time intelligence in this series and also look forward to the next one, which we'll be talking about real-time dashboards. Thank you.